coded. So welcome to everybody. We are so pleased to see so many people here. I know it's not a great time for everybody. <laughs> Trying to find a time that suits people all over the place is very difficult. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, and as I said before, it's great to see so many familiar names on the list. Fantastic to see you all. Um, so welcome everybody to the first in our new series of Anatolian lectures from Arwa. Um, obviously set up with the idea of promoting the archeology span of Western and Central Asia. And we have organized this together with Rana Özbal and Michele Massa, uh, all of us here in Turkey, um, with an idea of uh, bringing you a program of really varied presentations um, on the subject of identities, which is an enormously important part of archaeology, obviously, for all of us. And we wanted to bring we wanted to bring as many different perspectives on this as possible. So we have nine lectures in this series in February and March, um, from all periods, all covering topics all the way from the Paleolithic until the medieval times. So something, hopefully something for everybody to enjoy. Um, yes. So, uh, without further ado, and on the theme of identities and how we can think about identities in archaeology, um, we are very pleased to have our first presenter, Sarah Yellowzer, um, who is currently working on the Small Things Big Stories project. Um, she is a specialist in personal ornaments as I'm sure you all know. Um, she completed her PhD at Istanbul University uh, on the ornaments of Ashiklahuk. She's been working on ornaments from all kinds of different places in Turkey, um, from late prehistory. She's also been working in the University of Bordeaux on ornaments, more ornaments, more data to do with ornaments. <laughs> Fantastic data gathering. Um, and uh, obviously, I'm also speaking as an ornament specialist. It's great to see people working in detail on prehistoric ornaments. It's something that has not been very much researched in Turkey until quite recently. So it's a fantastically exciting area to be working in um, because everything that gets done is brand new. So it's for this reason, uh, along with many others, Sarah's research is really exciting. And she's going to give you um, a big overview <laughs> of all kinds of ways that we can think about identities using ornaments um, in the later prehistory of Turkey. Um, so I will hand over to Sarah, who should be able to share her slides, I hope. I'm trying now. Okay. Okay, I think it's working fine. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Brilliant. Okay, over to you. <laughs> thank, thank you for the introduction, Emma. Uh, uh, and thank you all for inviting me to give the first lecture in the series. Uh, I'm very happy to be a part of the lecture series. Uh, so. Today, I will try to explore ways of uh, understanding cultural and individual identities in Anatolia throughout prehistory uh, by focusing on some snapshots from different periods um, through a study of personal ornaments, as Emma explained better than me, actually, in the intro. Uh, first, I will try to uh, give a brief definition, not a definition per se, but I will try to talk about a bit on what constitutes our identities, like different concepts. And then I will talk a little bit about the traditional narratives towards identity and uh, body adornment in Anatolian prehistory. And um, in an attempt to question how we can challenge those traditional narratives, I will um, 
try to give some brief insights from archaeology, ethnography, and evolutionary anthropology. And this will be followed by um, case studies from Anatolian prehistory from the late Paleolithic um, to the early Bronze Age. Uh, so this is a big question and very difficult to explain, to be honest. Um, but um, we can define it as a complex uh, web of relations that define us and how we situate ourselves within social contexts. And there are components of it, such as our bodies, uh, how our bodies change bioculturally, as in life cycles, and how uh, our body, bodily appearances also change along with that. So it is fluid throughout our life courses, and it can also be embraced and then abandoned and then re-embraced in certain moments in our lives or other different social contexts. Uh, it is also um, formed and negotiated through our social roles, tasks, daily routines and habits. Uh, and last but not least, um, identities are formed by social relations in different scales, such as between individuals, between communities and generations also. So uh, considering all of these in mind, um, I find the best definition comes from Oliver Harris as the outcome of relations that constitute bodies, things and people, which also makes us think that material culture, such as personal ornaments, uh, has a very central role in this. Uh, but Despite its complex definition, uh, the traditional mainstream approaches towards identity in Anatolian prehistory especially has been uh, a little bit simplistic. Uh, the traditional approaches have tended to um, associate burial customs, architecture, imagery, and body adornment uh, with most often with concepts of status, social inequality, status, prestige, uh, male dominance, and then uh, op opposing to that with goddesses and fertility. Uh, and these approaches kind of still persist. For example, in a, a recent publication, personal ornaments from Neolithic burials have been associated with concepts such as uh, elegance and uh, as an indicator of a stratified social structure. But I want to ask, um, can we get a more nuanced understanding of identity and difference if we abandon the stratified social structure discourse? For example, in ethnographic contexts, uh, studies show that egalitarianism does not always mean sameness. So we can imagine, in other words, that social differentiation and uh, different ways of displaying cultural and individual identities do not necessarily have to take place in a stratified social setting. Uh, and personal ornaments give uh, insights into meaningful and complex ways to think about identity and difference. Uh, to start, I want to talk um, a little bit about the different meanings and functions of ornaments and uh, how they have been approached in archaeological and ethnographic contexts. Uh, for example, researchers have shown that personal adornment was amongst the earliest means of the culturalization of the body and sharing sociocultural information via painting, piercing, and decorating the body. Um, a very recently published article, for example, has identified distinct uh, cultural groups, cultural identities that were signaled via practices, different practices of body adornment, but it was not necessarily defined by kinship or genetic ties. Uh, ethnographic examples, for example, show exchange, reciprocity, and gift giving help sharing of cultural traits. They create and enhance social status and social re relations, uh, such as the, uh, for example, the female solidarity groups in some hunter-gatherer populations, where uh, gift giving, for example, gift giving of uh, necklaces and bracelets, uh, contribute to the sustaining of those uh, different social groups. But also in archaeology, we see sometimes cultural identities persist despite this kind of contacts between different cultures. Um, and another very, I think, very meaningful way of thinking about ornaments is uh, the concept of objects of attachment. Uh, in her recent book, Penny Speakins, for example, says, I'm quoting her, Objects that act like compensatory attachment figures also tend to be easily portable and show many signs of wear. And I think this definition fits 
perfectly well with the personal ornaments we find in archaeological contexts. Uh, and to these approaches, I also want to add the uh, metaphorical, performative, and fluid meanings of body decoration to add an emphasis on the importance of context in our studies. For example, in this quote here, we see that tying strings, uh, for example, bracelets on the wrists of babies, uh, is also a metaphorical performance. And in the same vein, uh, for example, for pregnant women, tying strings around their belly while they were pregnant has a special meaning. And then after the baby is born and weaned, women change the location on the body where they tie the strings of ador adornment. This example shows, for example, the context-specific functions and meanings of body adornment practices, as well as um, their changes in use throughout the life cycle of both adults and also infants and children. Uh, and also we see that meanings can be related not only to the object, but also to the acts and performances inherent to their use. Uh, so from there, I want to give a, a little bit of simplistic uh, overview as a background uh, to our topic. Here you see the temporal trends in personal ornamentation practices in Anatolia. Uh, so for the Upper Paleolithic, we have unfortunately few evidence, but this is mostly due to lack of research, we can say. Uh, but thanks to extensive research in one site dating to the initial upper Paleolithic, that is the Uch Özlü cave, we know that certain shells, uh, such as the Tritya Gibbosula you see here, uh, have been very persistently used uh, throughout period since the upper Paleolithic onwards. And then with the Epipaleolithic, uh, similar to what was going on in the neighboring regions, we start to see stone beads in addition to shells. Uh, but then with especially the PPMB, we begin to see complex technological practices that uh, require the application of several technical steps and the know-how to implement them, uh, which came along with the diversification of bead forms. Uh, and this investment in stone bead production and experimentation of techniques and forms continues into the later Neolithic. Uh, during this period, we see the use of already known techniques on um, materials that were previously not uh, used to used in a big extent. Um, so after this overview, uh, the first snapshot I want to, the case study I want to look at is the um, Pnarbaşı rock shelter in central Anatolia. So as early as the late Paleolithic, we see uh, somehow an interplay between mobility and identity expression in mortuary contexts. Uh, recent research at the site uh, have started to give evidence in favor of its use as an extensive cemetery. Uh, it is located about 120, 180 kilometers from uh, the Mediterranean coast. Uh, and recent isotopic studies have shown the mobility of local individuals. And there we have adults as well as, as, well as sub-adults buried with uh, Mediterranean shells. Uh, so possibly hinting at uh, the mobility of adults and then the sharing and the transmission of beads uh, among different generations, which end up in funerary contexts. And then moving to Southeast Anatolia and with the formation of the earliest sedentary settlements, we see, especially in this region, we see an enormous diversification of forms, materials and technologies. Uh, so this site, Bonjuku Tarla, uh, it's a pre-pottery Neolithic site from um, the PPNA until the end of PPMB, uh, located in Mardin, is currently a part um, of a project uh, led by Emma Baisal uh, to understand the human ornament relationships and its role in identity construction. Uh, and um, I will just briefly touch upon some preliminary evidence uh, we have on the role of ornaments in identity construction at Bonji Kutarla um, in different scales, because we have in situ evidence from the burials suggesting the presence of two different scales of body adornment practices, one being um, altering bodily appearances in a permanent way, like um, the use of uh, ear plugs and labrets, um, lip plugs. Uh, and ethnographically, we know these practices most often are associated with uh, rites of passages. And the other practice is the 
temporary ornamentation practices, of course, in the form of beads and pendants, and they're used in life as well as in burial rituals. Uh, so there was a high investment in the enhancement and diversification of bodily appearances, and it was coupled with uh, some of the earliest technological advances we see. Uh, for example, the use of obsidian in ornament production, which is a very hard and um, hard to work material. Uh, here you see an example of an obsidian earplug, uh, if you will. We see abrasion striations and chipping scars. Uh, so as early as PPN, and before that, we, we know that um, obsidian is more extensively used in ornament production uh, during the Holof period. But with these examples, we start to understand the roots of these uh, complex technologies. Um, and the assemblage also allows us to track the rescaling of uh, a regional symbolism onto the human body, because we know um, these symbols and concepts that we know in larger, more monumental scales from other sites in the, in the region, uh, for example, at Göbekli Tepe, Gusirhöyük, Körtik Tepe, and other sites, uh, at Bonjikul Tarla were somehow rescaled onto the human body to be carried on the body, like uh, the bracers and the, the belts and the um, zoomorphic and anthropomorphic uh, pendants, for example. Uh, the widespread distribution of these symbolic practices in the region has suggested their role in a shared regional or a cultural identity. But in this uh, example, we have the chance to investigate how these symbols and practices might have been related to maybe individual lives and identities of, uh, uh, for example, gender, age, personhood, et cetera. So it gives a, a very exciting ground to beginning investigating these concepts. Uh, and our studies have recently started, but we already have evidence also suggesting that some of the beads uh, found in burials as parts of larger composite ornaments were used before being buried with those individuals. Uh, and beads found in burials provide us with actually snapshots in prehistory to understand their role uh, in identity construction and the diverse practices relating to biological sex and age categories through which we can discuss concepts such as gender, social aid, personhood, and so on. Uh, and my studies in two PPN sites in Central Anatolia have been focusing on that issue, actually. Uh, and most of the data comes from Ashikla, uh, which is a very well-known well transitional site in Cappadocia from the initial stages of sedentism to the formation of a, a large and dense village settlement. Uh, and at Ashikla, uh, we have um, a total of 103 burials, individuals buried on site, but the uh, burials with beads, uh, they belong to the later phases, dating to the 8th millennium BC, uh, and they constitute um, uh, around 29%, 30 individuals of the overall number, and among them, uh, female adults, followed by sub-adults, and then adult males, males are majority. Uh, and the earliest individuals uh, buried with ornaments were infants and children, uh, dating the earliest one dating to the early 8th millennium BC. Uh, and this child was buried in a um, building that is larger in size in comparison to the contemporary buildings. Uh, and we have some evidence in favor of its uh, communal use. Uh, and the child was buried with three stone beads on the neck, all displaying uh, traces of use wear. So suggesting that uh, the beads were in circulation for a long time, possibly, presumably, before the burial of the child. Um, and a couple of uh, phases later, we see the adorned adult individuals uh, during the mid-8th millennium BC. The first two adult burials who were buried with ornaments belong to uh, male adults buried in the same building during different phases. And here we see uh, a combination of different concepts in ornament use. For example, um, one individual among uh, the bead group, the individual was buried with, one example has uh, use wear in the form of uh, a notch form formation on its perforation edge, 
uh, and some irregular situations on the same phase suggesting the use of the uh, item uh, maybe like as a button before being assembled uh, into a composite ornament to be buried with the individual uh, and the other individual stands out in terms of raw material diversity the number of beads in a single ornament the use of non-local items and the mixing of uh, new and old technologies such as the combination of shells with uh, the butter fly beads that you see here, made from very hard uh, mappable stone types. And the number of uh, Mediterranean shells used in this ornament is uh, actually more than half of the overall number of uh, shells we found at the site throughout phases and contexts. Uh, and furthermore, the two uh, large butterfly beads, although belonging to the same technological procedure, uh, they display nuances in technology. Uh, for example, the carnelian Beat has a dull polish, whereas the uh, other butterfly bead uh, has a higher polished, like lustered surface, uh, suggesting different finishing techniques had been applied. And such, uh, okay, such technologically complex beads were actually not exclusive to adults. Sorry. Mm. And one example comes from a rare instance of a double burial, a child buried with an adult. Uh, and the beads uh, you can see here all were found uh, on the child's neck. And uh, they're, they're similar in composition, technology, material, and form to uh, the adult ornaments we see at Ashikla. For example, you can see here um, that the carnelian butterfly bead has a very perfectly well-aligned perforation, indicating a skilled producer that managed to uh, drill two long perforation tubes with perfect alignment. And on the other beads, uh, we see use wear in the form of polish, irregular striations, and also uh, perforation edge deformation. Uh, all of this, again, suggesting that the uh, infants and children at the site uh, were buried with items that had been possibly in circulation for a very long time uh, before uh, their death. Uh, and also through sub-adult adornment, uh, we can discuss some other concepts such as social age and personhood. Um, at Ashikla being buried with assembled ornaments that are similar in quantity to uh, adult ornaments uh, is exclusive to children above the age of three. Uh, the infants and children below that age only had single beads or bead pairs. Um, and we know uh, from some ethnographic examples that identity and personal attribution uh, comes from after a certain age uh, that is marked by some biocultural thresholds such as weaning and walking. And in some cases, this was also signified through different uh, personal ornamentation practices. Uh, so. Presumably at Ashikla, such a practice of um, such an age specific practice of uh, ornamentation could be interpreted as the age of three being uh, significant to attribute, attribute children uh, personhood and it uh, might have been signified through the use of adornment similar to adults. Uh, and we are starting to gain uh, further evidence to suggest that sub-adult adornment was a means to create social ties and attribute identity uh, as a wider neolithic phenomenon. Uh, and one such example comes from Balıklı. It's a neighboring site in Cappadocia, and we have earlier adorned burials uh, at this site, uh, dating to the uh, mid to late 9th millennium BC. Uh, and in one of the buildings we excavated in 2022, a child, uh, you can see here, was buried in the earliest phase. And then during the later phase, an infant was buried. Uh, all had um, heavily used, uh, broken, and then reused uh, personal ornaments. Um, so the transmission of items uh, was a way of creating social ties in a way, maybe between uh, individuals of different generations, which we can track in uh, the funeral record through personal ornaments. So now returning to Ashikla, uh, another way to track those social relations is um, an investigation of the B-type associations between individuals. For example, uh, the use of single 
beads, uh, most often in green color. A tashitlu was uh, exclusive to females above the age of 40 and, as I said, sub-adults below the age of three. And to that, we, it's a, uh, we have rare examples, but uh, the red pigment use we can add because we don't see it with uh, male burials. Uh, and uh, also as part of an ongoing um, research with uh, colleagues from Bordeaux University, we are starting to apply statistical and network analysis on this data set. Um, I'm not going to show it here today, but, today, but I'm going to show uh, another uh, preliminary analysis, discriminant analysis, when we plot um, individuals based on their biological sex and age categories and beat type associations, uh, we see uh, that middle and old adult females and sub-adults cluster somewhat tightly, uh, but more importantly, the middle adult males cluster very tightly. Uh, one old adult male is kind of in between. So um, we're trying to understand and begin investigating uh, how those B-type associations um, contributed to the formation of social groups within the community. Um, but we can say that um, there was an emphasis on age across all of these uh, variations and similarities in ornamentation practices um, at Ashitla that suggest the importance of age and life course in the construction of identities. So uh, for example, we have no newborns with beads. Uh, being buried with beads, beads begins only after one month and, and until three years of age we have either uh, sub-adults with single beads in some cases with bead pairs uh, and more importantly we know uh, through isotopic studies that um, weaning ends at Ashitlu at two years of age so uh, the sub-adults uh, around the three around three years of age who had uh, ornaments similar to adult ornaments were no longer breastfeeding. So uh, it might have been a factor in attributing identity, even personhood maybe. But more interestingly, after that, until 30 years of age, uh, no children, no young adults, adolescents, they didn't have beads. So uh, another dimension could relate to reaching a certain age, like the age of 30. And after that, some uh, individuals had uh, beat groups, um, that had various materials and technologies uh, known from distant regions. So uh, another dimension we can add to the formation of identities could be participating in certain um, interaction networks. So uh, this takes us to the technological aspects of beads, like the butterfly beads in central Anatolia, uh, and the interplay between technology, meaning, and value. These beads, as I had mentioned, belong to complex technological processes, and they have striking morphometric, typological, and technological similarities with the middle Euphrates sites, such as Abu Huraira, Halula, etc. But at, in central Anatolia, at Ashitlu and Balıklı, we have no evidence uh, for their on-site uh, production, which suggests their arrival in the region as exchange commodities with um, a sort of socio-economic value. Uh, and at, at Ashitlu, both females and males had access to these import materials. Uh, so in adult burials, they perhaps signified the social roles and uh, their participation in exchange networks. But at the same time, we see these beads in sub-adult burials too. Uh, so they also gain another dimension of meaning, maybe uh, attributing those beads intimate functions that signify social ties between adults and some young children. Uh, and also these beads um, are also a means to approach um, the actions, skill levels and the de decision-making processes of uh, individual artisans and by extension to understand different social categories in prehistory such as craftspeople. Uh, so for example, a study of the drilling profiles of these um, carnelian beads, uh, we have detected that um, they have different alignments and different morpholo morphologies. For example, the uh, well-aligned examples 
show the control of the drill, driller uh, over the material, the tool, as well as their motions. But we also have slanted but aligned examples, which shows their ad adaptability uh, and solutions when encountered with difficulties during the drilling processes. Uh, at the same time, variation in tube morphologies uh, indicate the use of different tools. So we can say that these beads were produced possibly at different times or by different bead makers and then uh, brought together, accumulated in the same ornament through time after exchange and circulation. Uh, we can think about similar concepts through disc beads assembled into composite ornaments also. Uh, for example, in the case of uh, a three years old child buried with a bead group that had disc beads from um, different uh, color colors and measurements, uh, we see that uh, their measurements show some uh, of them overlap, but uh, they were uh, probably based on raw material produced in different uh, groups and then assembled within the same ornament. So we, we can think that combination of such technological variations in the same ornament uh, suggests that beads were often produced in different times by different bead makers uh, and then brought together in the same ornament. Um, so this was the story not all of it, but some parts of it for the PPN. But what happens after the PPN, pre-pottery Neolithic in Anatolia? So we see during the late Neolithic that um, there is um, something new going on with especially shell beads. So for example, we see new geometric forms, uh, new shell types, uh, suggesting um, the multidirectional movement of concepts and ideas, especially from the West to the East towards uh, Western Anatolia, even to um, Central Anatolia at Çatalhöyük, where we see uh, like a melting pot of Western and Eastern uh, ornamental preferences. But the high investment in stone bead production continues and proliferates. Uh, we see skilled production with roots in the earlier PPMB, but at the same time, uh, we begin to see uh, dedicated workshops, for example, at Kumartepe and uh, production areas in Köşköyük in central Anatolia, uh, also yeah, in Domustepe and Terkurdu, also the use of obsidian. Uh, and along with that, we see new technologies and cross-craft interactions, such as heating, metallurgy, coloring technologies, all of this um, suggest the sharing of new cultural elements between communities and regions. So identities begin interacting in new ways, but also art artisanal identities, crafts people be begin to become a, a much more tangible um, concept. Uh, so I'm going to return to Balıklı now uh, because the post-Neolithic, we have some post-Neolithic intrusive burials at the site dating uh, roughly to the fifth millennium uh, BC uh, and these burials and their ornaments uh, offer a glimpse into these new concepts such as new technologies as well as mobility and landscape interaction. So during the fifth millennium BC the site was visited by um, presumably a mobile group because uh, apart from burials we have no evidence of their activities at the site uh, and they buried some of their dead uh, inside graves that were dug into the walls of an earlier Neolithic building that you see here. Uh, and one of the individuals was buried with small disc beads, uh, you can see here, uh, and discoid um, freshwater union um, beads. Um, and all of them were covered with uh, a paste-like red residue uh, that stick them together. Also, we see this residue kind of twisted, resembling maybe a string. Uh, but I want to especially focus on the union beads here uh, because this type of configuration of shell beads is rather unique in Anatolia, as far as I know. Uh, we we know union beads with slightly similar forms from late Chateau during the pre-pottery, uh, during the pottery Neolithic. But I think more similar examples dating uh, to the same period to the fifth millennium BC comes from a site near the Caspian Sea, actually. Uh, in this case, marine shells were used uh, in a very similar composition. Uh, so this kind of a relationship may suggest a 
far-reaching connection and mobility between distant regions, but at the same time, in this uh, case, the use of locally available freshwater shells as a substitute, in a sense, uh, may relate to the adaptation of cultural identities and memory in a different setting in Cappadocia. Uh, and another contemporaneous uh, burial was a young adult male with uh, pathologies related to a dislocated shoulder um, that might have resulted with impaired mobility. And again, we see um, uh, the use of a paste-like red residue covering the surface of beads, sticking them together, but also um, this uh, morphology suggests its use in um, maybe coloring the strings as well. So uh, ochre, ha I mean, red pigments or presumably ochre has always been associated with symbolic meanings. But in these examples, we see an interplay with, between symbolic and functional uh, uses of um, pigments uh, in a sense. Um, so the next millennia, uh, early Bronze Age, uh, witnessed uh, dramatic changes in social organization of communities. Uh, so here I will give an example from Bashir Hoyuk, uh, EBA burials, thanks to the amazing work done by Emma Baisal and uh, Gonja Dardenis, we have good evidence uh, and we can tell multiple tales from graves, uh, such as the beads show mass production, as well as uh, various procurement strategies. Uh, we have uh, sources and technologies indicating long distance trade, such as shells from Red Sea, metal pins from Iran, as well as carnelian beads that suggest connections with the East, uh, for example, the Indus civilizations, but also with the West, for example, with Troy, uh, and all combined in the same ornament and placed in the graves with individuals. But we also see uh, worn and fresh examples within the same composite items of adornment, like you see here. Uh, and some beads display very pronounced wear, indicating their prolonged use lives and curation. Uh, and these ornaments belonging to young individuals, bring they bring together different objects and at the same time stories. We see items brought to the site via long distance trade, items belonging to complex crafting processes, uh, both heavily used and unused items, uh, suggesting that these objects were probably possibly transmitted between individuals, perhaps within the same social group, rather than uh, signifying individual merit-based sta status as uh, suggested for this period. Uh, so through some snapshots from the late Epipaleolithic to the early Bronze Age, I've tried to track uh, cultural and personal identities uh, via body adornment in different contexts. But uh, along these uh, different periods, we see some recurrent themes actually that contribute to the construction and display of identities. One of them is the interplay between innovation and conservation. We see new technologies were often combined with uh, forms known from earlier periods that can be regarded as familiar things uh, memorized. Uh, and in most cases, objects are very worn, indicating their transmission between individuals or generations through which memory was created, sustained and transmitted. Uh, and through the use of beads, we see a twofold emphasis on uh, life cycle, age and social relations, as well as exchange and far reaching connections. Uh, but we still have um, big research gaps to complete the picture actually for two crucial periods in Anatolia. Uh, one is the upper Paleolithic to understand the roots of these practices, but also uh, we have huge evidence from upper Paleolithic Europe um, in the use uh, regarding the use of ornaments uh, in the construction of both cultural and individual identities. But we don't know much uh, for Upper Paleolithic in Anatolia, uh, but we also lack crucial contextual evidence for late Neolithic and Chalcolithic periods also. Uh, so this is what I have for today, uh, but the, all of this research wouldn't have been possible without the help and mentoring and collaboration of many people. Some I managed to mention here, some I couldn't. Uh, and thank you all very much for your patience. Okay, should I stop sharing or continue? Oops.
Yeah, sure. I mean, let's see. Um, thank you so much for that. <laughs> it's really interesting to see all this put together, all these lots of different stories put together to make a one great big long overview, actually. Um, we tend to look in great detail at small things all the time. Um, yeah, that was really interesting. I am sure there are going to be questions. Um, you are very welcome, everybody, to either write questions in the chat uh, or just uh, ask. The floor is open for anybody who wants to ask anything to Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Can, can I can ask a It was a great lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, many questions, but I might start with one, uh, which is uh, um, actually for my master thesis, I, I had done an analysis of uh, an early Bronze Age uh, cemetery at the Nil Jihu. Um, and in fact, from other kinds of uh, evidence, it was very clear the same sort of threshold age uh, threshold that you mentioned with ornament. Uh, so I was, uh, uh, and that is very, very, very striking for the early Bronze Age. It's very standardized in a way. Um, but at, at the same time, uh, while there is a lot of normative behavior, what I find also interesting is the outliers, right? So mm -hmm. there is a, a, a person uh, that is a biologically a female, but uh, buried in a sort of a male attire and uh, may position and with a battle axe right so uh, we maybe start thinking about uh, um, different ways of display uh, gender um, or sexual orientation and I was wondering uh, specifically that uh, individual that was in between the two groups at Ashikla uh, whether you have any idea whether you have a further elements to piece up together their story their uh, <laughs> okay great question and uh i mean i'm pretty sure eb bronze age gives a uh, far more evidence to more tangible evidence to discuss this i i think it was because he was old like he was above 60 or 60 uh so he lived a long life for that period so um like for example in ethnographic context, again, after menopause, um, women, um, it's a threshold that changes their uh, social cultural identity and roles. So for, for males also, maybe aging was something important. What's weird for the Ashikla data is that here we're talking about 30 individuals. <laughs> it's a mm -hmm. subgroup itself within the community, yeah. But you're right, actually, now I remember in Asanlu, which is a site in Western Iran, Iron Age, uh, older, older males, at least, you know, uh, biologically males, they seem to have uh, more characteristics of female barriers. So, yeah. yes, that might be, yes. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have a question. Can I ask as well? Absolutely. Go for it. Um, hi, and thanks for this uh, wonderful lecture. It was extremely, I, I was really impressed. I'm just an undergrad, so it's all new new for me. Um, I was going to ask about the bead production systems. So um, when I was working in the field, uh, we would sometimes find these really extremely small beads or really large beads as well sometimes. But what I always found that some of them, the small ones were sometimes extremely small and they were um, almost sometimes perfect in their like outing, like they were so um, smooth. At one point, we were wondering if one of them was actually accidentally fallen into the sample from modern day beads. But um, if since they're so small and sometimes so um, clean, like polished and stuff, um, how do we have any idea about how these uh, technologies, how these um, skills are taught through generations? Like, um, is there an age group that focused like maybe children are better at or at adults are better at or maybe females and males? Do we know any difference between the social groups that produce these uh, beats or is there is it a general um, social um, group talent that everybody is capable of? 
it's a very good but a very difficult question i think yeah. i mean archaeologically as um, i mean if they're not uh, buried with for example unfinished beads or bead making tools it's a bit difficult to discuss this but again uh, i want to return to ethnographic examples because uh, to be able to produce those kind of beads especially not just the small ones but the big ones that are part of a a very complex technological process um, you need experience skill developed through experience but also some motor capabilities uh, that comes after um, I don't know a, a, a age of eight I, I'm not sure if I remember correctly right now but mm -hmm. fine motor skills uh, I'm also a psychology major so I took like developmental psychology <laughs> um, so actually female children develop their fine motor skills far more earlier than male children and around the age of like um, seven to eight they're more capable of their fine motor skills that's why they le start learning at that age to how to write because they can actually hold the pen properly mm -hmm. yeah but archaeologically oh, i wish i knew a way <laughs> to detect this i don't know emma what do you think <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> we have no idea. <laughs> Sadly, maybe one day. <laughs> okay, thank you for that question. Very good question. We have one from Blader During from the chat who says, thanks for a very interesting presentation. Um, do you see a transformation of ornament use with the rise of cemeteries? And he says, sorry if you covered that. I had various people coming in during the talk. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we, we, we should look into that. Yeah, but we need like good contextual data to be able to compare. Yeah, I agree. It's a difficult one. I mean, I think yeah we're going to see some more earlier things we have so few early examples at the moment if, right it's that's you know it's a problem definitely we'll see leave that one for the future probably um ellen has her hand up ellen what did you want to ask yes hello i am on a device with a broken camera so sorry um so uh, Mike, uh, thank you very much for your talk. And uh, you know, it's really important to look at beads within their context. So thank you for going into detail about the context in the mortuary context, which is um, what you covered here. My question is not what you, you said you would talk about, is about all those other beads that we find um, in contexts that are so unremarkable that we might not even know, that especially for the late Neolithic that um, you said you didn't have um, context for, the period that I normally work in. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have, uh, you know, the burials that we do find, uh, they might have some ornaments in the fill, uh, but uh, it's not, really we can't really say whether a lot of like whether it came from the film or it was intentionally put in and also uh my question is about um also i think uh what about um these the use of beads that are not personal ornaments um beads on uh, buildings, on animals, on baskets, and indirect uh, ornamentation of persons on um, on garments, for example. So uh, th that's, that's, I think that's it. Exactly, we should look into that. I mean, uh, there's so much to do. Uh, for the case of Ashikle, uh, I can say, uh, there is this interesting thing because um, it's been the site has been occupied since uh, as early as the uh, mid 9th millennium BC, but until the 8th millennium BC for uh, a long period, we have burials uh, with no personal ornaments or any type of grave goods, but we have beads uh, found in, um, I don't know, small open area production contexts maybe, uh, and fields uh, dumped in middens, um, or some other types of personal ornamentation like belt buckles um, in on the floors inside the buildings. So uh, 
um, yeah, it's it's kind of a project that should be done like alongside to be able to detect various ways of um, ornament use other than the human body. Yeah, I think. Um, I don't know if I've been able to answer those. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think you're you're right that it's a lived use of beads. Yeah. Li living living people's use of beads and activities, they fall off. Yeah, it's true. We had a couple. I sorry, I'm just chipping in here, but we had a couple of examples from Bonjuk Luhuk where we're completely convinced that they were lost during the manufacturing process, probably in the mats that were on the floors in the houses. And the beads were so small that probably people would never find them again. They probably didn't even bother. They just disappeared under the um, flooring material. So, yeah, there's a lot more to think about, you know, definitely, for sure. Um, Rana has a question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Um, thank you for the very interesting uh, talk, Sarah. It was really um, nice to see this large overview. Uh, I was um, fascinated, especially by the, the fifth millennium burials. This is the first I even heard of them. Uh, and... Uh, about the, uh, I think that this this pasty stuff is that like a technological uh, innovation? Uh, I want to know that, and I'd also like to know. Uh, I'm sure there's been many surveys done in the region. Uh, what other information is there uh, that you might know about for um, you know, sort of middle uh, Calcolithic? I mean, is there something else that you're aware of? No. No, no, I, I'm not aware of it, but I'm sure there is info out there. I just haven't looked at uh, regarding the, uh, I want to show the slide, but. I think you can still show it. I mean, I'm able to see your slides. Okay. Yeah, the piece, I mean, it's clearly something that, uh, I, it, it's something new, right? It's not something that we know from previous period. I mean, this is sort of like part of the, uh, you know, the innovation, I think, right? I think so too, definitely. But we need to analyze because I, I think this is not just ochre, but something mixed with it to make it like paste-like. So I see. it needs analysis. We haven't done that yet. Right. Uh, at least in North Mesopotamia, there are actually cemeteries. So um, it could be a cemetery settlement. I mean, it could be a cemetery for some settlement that is in the vicinity as well. It's something to keep yes. in mind as well. Yes, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it'd be very interesting to to know this because um, it's sort of a composite of, uh, uh, you know, techniques, in fact. And is it something we even know? Do we even have any other examples, whether it's fifth millennium, anything else? I mean, this looks very unique to me. Uh, no. No, uh, a very similar configuration uh, I've seen in a very recent article from the Caspian Sea, but uh, they're not freshwater shells, they're marine shells. Uh, they're not covered with some this paste-like thing, but um, due to the uh, properties of the uh, soil they were left in, they became intact. So the configuration is very similar, uh, like small discoid beads next to each other, but this kind of use of paste-like residue, I haven't seen so far. Maybe we don't know or not published or maybe it's unique. I really don't okay. know. All right. It's very interesting. Thank you very much for, for your insight. Thanks, Rana. Um, Ellen just added, at 6th millennium Dominus Tepe, we also have white beads covered with red. So, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, and then we have a question from Nisa Nasir, who says, you mentioned that there were some isotopic studies at one of the cemeteries. What insights did those provide? Could you say more about what kind of analysis it was? Okay, uh, so uh, one was published in, uh, let me see, I think it was, yeah, 2010. Um, it was on uh, the age of weaning detected through isotopes at Ashikla and Chayonu. So um, I can write it on the chat, but I need to find the um, name of the article. And the other one was uh, from Narbushu, uh, again, Pearson et al., obviously. Uh, so 
it was a strontium isotope analysis of, yeah, if I remember correctly, of uh, Pnarbashi and Bonjuku individuals. So they gave info on the mobility of individuals or if they were local or uh, grew up somewhere else. Well, there you go. I think Rana has just extremely helpfully posted that reference for us. Thank you, Rana. <laughs> Great. Um, Ellen also just added that stone disbeads probably the colour was created by firing after the beads were made, like an early fire. So that's certainly true for the, yeah, the white ones, I would suspect. Definitely. Any more questions, thoughts? Further things you want to share? No? If not, oh, hang on. Okay, we have another question in the messages from Dan, thanks. Uh, goes for the very enlightening and thought, uh, exhilarating talk, Sarah, and to the organizers. Here is my question. And please do correct me if misconceptualized or understood by me. The beads are representative agents which are expressing identity. As it seems, identity changes through time of individuals as life progresses, and this results in very dynamic identity and makes very layered identities. And considering uh, being members of a group, gender or cross person, etc., enhances these layers. So can we say that beads are progressively abandoned regained or transferred amongst the members uh any way to identify if th this is happening or taking place especially if the focus is expressionism or representation or alterations stand for the transitions ex exchanges of the roles or abandonments of the roles and the beads oh. <laughs> okay it's a nice <laughs> <laughs> i mean Hard to say with certainty, but yeah, why not? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a complicated interpretation to make, definitely. Um, Daniel Pereira asks: uh, Has any chemical analysis been made on the red residue in the beads to check origin, etc., assuming it's not related to the ground within the burial? Yeah, not yet, but we should at some point. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it would give good information, but not yet. Yeah, okay. Work in progress. Let's say. <laughs> we'll call that work in progress. <laughs> okay, awesome. Any more questions? Final, I think this is our final chance before we wrap up. If there's no more questions, I will finish by uh, reminding everybody that next week, um, same day, next Thursday, same time, so it'll be six o'clock, we have um, Isel Arslan, who's going to be talking about fingerprints. So even closer to the human body, in the human body, um, in archeological context, um, so do everybody join us for that. And obviously, if you know other people who might be interested, please also share our information. Um, thank you all once again for listening. Uh, this uh, talk will be shared via YouTube. So anybody who has... Uh, either arrived late or not had the opportunity to join in. And again, please tell anybody who might be interested, it will be available um, soon, hopefully. Um, and we look forward to seeing everybody next time. Thank you so much for attending. And thank you so much to Sarah for this really, really interesting talk. <laughs> it was great. Everyone. Thank you. Okay.